Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'll call the Crow Wing County Committee of the Whole special meeting for September 1, 2020 to order. Our first order of business today is to hear from the five applicants for the Natural Resources Advisory Committee position. Number one is Mr. Pence. Chris, you can hear us okay? I sure can. Can you hear me okay too? We can. So I, my first question, and you know, we want to hear a little bit of sort of why you feel you are perhaps the most qualified or the most interested in this position. But my two questions for you would be, first, what would you see as the number one priority for this committee? And then what's your long-term vision that you would see this committee, how it would be interacting with the rest of the county? Okay, well, uh, thanks very much for the questions and, and uh, it's uh, great to be here with you guys this morning. Um, you know, for me, I would say, you know, the number one um, thing I think that's most important that we want to focus on is uh, maintaining the effective uh, um, forest management that the county does on the tax forfeited land. Uh, you know, right now the county is, uh, has certification through SFI and I want to, would want to continue that. Uh, I think it's important. We have 105,000 acres of, of that land that, that the county manages. And, uh, and I think that's important for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, um, the forest product industry um, needs to be uh, um, viable, and to do that, it needs wood. And uh, Crow Wing County has that, and I think we should continue um, producing um, wood for that, for that industry. And second of all, I think uh, just as important, even more important, is just the local jobs. A uh, lot of a lot of local loggers, a lot of folks um, uh, work in that area in the county, and I think it's something that we should uh, uh, continue to uh, um, to encourage that uh, the opportunity for those local jobs. Uh, if what I see is long term on this uh, are a couple of things. One is that uh, I think this uh, committee has an opportunity to weigh in on recreational opportunities within the county. And I think that's a, a real key aspect of uh, encouraging tourism and bringing folks up into our area. Um, I think one of the key things I'd like to see this, excuse me? I don't think anybody oh, spoke, sorry. Chris. Oh, okay. I thought I heard something. Sorry about that. Uh, I just would like to, you know, focus one on is uh, protect protecting the existing trails that we currently have, uh, particularly the snowmobile trails. Uh, we have an excellent uh, trail program here, and I think that uh, um, we would want to uh, do the best we can to protect, protect those trails so that we don't have to try to do realignments mm -hmm. uh, for that, um, for some of those trails. And then um, as far as, uh, you know, ATV trails, I think that's another important aspect um, to the county. I'd like to focus on connecting existing trails and how do we make it so that it's easier for folks to uh, um, get around and, and transition on those trails easier. And then also just looking for opportunities for, um, you know, for the non-motorized opportunities also. I think there's a lot of great trail opportunities that, um, that we should focus on. But I think it's important that we um, make sure that when we work on these trails that we have clubs that we're partnering with so that uh, we have those folks managing and, and maintaining those trail systems. And the last piece I just wanted to mention quick that I think is important is land asset management. Um, you know, the county has a lot of land, and when I was land commissioner, you know, um, I had a list of properties previously from, you know, even previous land commissioners of inholdings or, you know, some of those parcels that the county would uh, like to acquire at some point to provide um, access to land that we don't currently have access to, and uh, and then to also um, protect those areas from, you know, future development where we might have to put infrastructure in, you know, onto uh, some of these more rural parcels that might not be realistic. Uh, and uh, at the same time, though, we do need to also look at parcels we would like to, um, you know, sell and divest ourselves of, ones that are isolated, not near existing county, you know, um, larger blocks of land, and also that are adjacent and existing to, you know, existing infrastructure, you know, roads and that, that would be much more conducive to private ownership than to, um, and to uh, being a county ownership. So I think that would be my long-term vision of what I'd like to see the committee focus on also. Anything else, Chris, from you? No, thanks, guys, for the opportunity. Good well, luck. And let, uh, let me just, um, if I can I'm just interrupt you, Chris, you. for a second. Do any of the other commissioners have questions for Chris? No, I think I'm good. No, I'm good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. Just to let uh, all of the applicants know, and I forgot to mention this previously, is that there is a five-minute limit 
on expressing your, your will to be on this committee. And the decision will be made on Tuesday for all of you so you know when the decision is going to be made. So thanks again, Chris. So next up thanks, would, would be Mr. Duvall. Mr. Duvall, are you on the line? Nope, he's not on the line. Okay, Mr. Duvall apparently is not with us today, so we'll move to the number three, Mr. Shannon. Hello, committee. My name is Daryl Shannon. I am a... Um, Long, not a long-term resident of Cross or Crow Wing County, but a 17-year owner of property in Crow Wing County. I am probably not like our previous candidate you heard from. I don't have any experience in, in dealing with land management and forestry management, but I am one who likes to ask a lot of questions. And as a citizen and representing a, a large group of our population, I would be on the committee to ask those kinds of questions that feed my interest and the committee's interest and help guide their future plans based on a view as a normal citizen. I don't know if I have anything more to tell you about myself other than I've been around a long time. I've been coming up to Crow Wing County for over 40 years. Um, many of them as a uh, weekender, vacationer, and uh, in the last 20 years I've owned property up here. So, so Mr. Shannon. Go ahead, I open, I'm open to any questions. What attracted you to come up here for that number of years to Crow Wing County? Why not some other county? I um, actually own a place on uh, Lake O'Brien. Uh, my neighbor 40 years ago was the best man at my wedding. I've been married over 50 years. He would invite us up for um, weekends and we'd uh, play and be uh, and recreate in the uh, Crow Wing County area. So it was the recreational opportunities, the clean lakes, the, the way the county managed its assets, would you say that's what drew you to this area? Yes, I would. I would say that's the key I believe that uh, Crow Wing County and its uh, watershed and its lakes are the uh, gold mine of the community. Okay, any questions from the other commissioners? Oh, yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Shannon, are you also uh, currently in the Cross Lake Parks and Recreation Committee? Commission? Yes, I am. What responsibilities do you have there? I sit on that commission and I help, I, we help uh, guide what our parks and uh, library actually is the connection to that area. Um, and right now we're looking at expanding a piece of uh, property that we've uh, got a lease on from the uh, DNR, or not the DNR, the um, Corps of Engineers, which is on the south shore of uh, Cross Lake. So we're constantly interested in trails. We have uh, snowshoe trails and um, those kinds of things in the uh, Cross Lake uh, area. Very good. And I have uh, chaired and sat on the uh, Public Works Commission in Cross Lake. I uh, chaired it for three years and sat on the commission for six. So I'm active in the um, community in looking at things around the um, Cross Lake area and I'm kind of hoping to expand that vision into the entire county. Okay, any other questions? Commissioner Hogue. If I could, uh, Mr. Shan, could you give us your, a quick, quick, your thoughts on trails in Crow Wing County, both non-motorized and motorized? Give us your thoughts on I, I am really impressed with what we see in Crosby as far as bike trails. They've done a marvelous thing with uh, off-road biking, uh, and I'm sure that that cuts across some of the state properties. Um, I would, 
I think that um, if you talk about non-motorized trails, I think uh, snowshoeing and cross-country skiing are a big part of this area and are starting to grow. Um, one of the interesting things that I would see in, in the form of motorized trails, and it kind of deals with the Paul Bunyan Trail, there's a lot of popularity in electric bicycles and electric scooters, and the um, paved portions of the Paul Bunyan Trail would be a great place for those people. And I know I have a 50-year-old daughter that rides one of those to work every day, and she would love to come up there and use the that uh, trail sections. And they're semi-motorized, so they're um, electric assist is probably a better description of the, those that equipment. As far as snowmobiles and ATV trails, um, I think there are lots of people in the area that do grooming. There's a um, snowmobile trails groomed along my along the roads that I see here in uh, Cross Lake, and they could easily be expanded. I know that from Cross Lake you can get all the way up, I think, to almost Walker on uh, uh, snowmobiles. Um, Mr. But I'm, I'm not a snowmobiler, but I'm not against them either. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. That was, you used your entire five minutes. I'm appreciative of that. You did a nice job. We appreciate it. Again, the decision will be made on Tuesday. So thank you very much for participating in this today. So well, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, and I thank you, and I hope you give me a serious consideration for the future. We will. Thank you. Next gentleman is uh, Mr. Moser. Yes, I'm here. Hello? Hi, are you going to just join us by telephone, or are you coming on video? Oh, uh, I didn't know I had the video option. I just, when I called, it just connected me to the, to the telephone. Are you, do you just... Do you want to, Mr. Moser, do you want to try to get on the video, or would you prefer to just stay on the phone? Uh, probably better if I just stay on the phone. Otherwise, I'll waste my five minutes trying to figure out the video. Well, we're, we're not that wicked that we wouldn't let you have time to get on the video, but let, let's just move ahead. And so there is a five minute time limit, as you noted. And the two questions that I have are, what do you see as our current highest priority for this commission? And what is your vision for the future, looking at 20 years out or so? So if you'll just go ahead and start with those questions, and then we'll see if the other commissioners have follow-up questions. Okay, sure, thanks. Uh, I see, well, the biggest thing I, I see there, you know, we, I know we have lots and lots of uh, tax forfeited land, uh, county forest, and um, I've been a, actually a user of that land for the last 40 years, um, and I think it's just a great opportunity for people to get out, explore nature, hunt, use the trails, uh, pick berries, you know, all that type of stuff. Uh, I, uh, the one thing I really enjoyed is I've been able to take our children out and, and, and use it as hunting area. Um, they've actually shot their first deer on, on county land as, as well as I've had four of my grandchildren have shot their first deer on county land. So it's been kind of a thrill for me just to pass that that on to them and and i see just continuing to keep the the county land available for the residents of crow wing county as well as the the tourists and visitors up to this area which which make it a kind of a strong strong spot to you know destination spot for people to come to um the future as far as the future of the land and and as you know the natural resources I see, you know, we also, you know, the lakes, keeping the lakes clean, uh, continuing to try to, you know, stop the all milfoil, uh, 
you know, different, you know, aquatic evasion, that type of stuff. Uh, try to keep that at bay, improve, improving the trail systems, uh, you know, especially, you know, the hiking, hiking trails, and, and just maybe, you know, using some of the, some of the land and looking at it for, for educational purposes for, for the schools, you know, getting, getting kids, kids out and using the outdoors at a young age, um, maybe setting up some kind of outdoor classroom areas in some of those forest areas that are accessible to them uh, and just for them to know what's what's out here and and something different than than being on the tablets and and phones all the time okay do any other commissioners have questions to follow up with mr moser I do not. Nope. okay mr moser thank you very much we appreciate you applying for this position and I'll just acknowledge that Tuesday is when we'll make the decision so we appreciate you participating today okay but thanks a lot for hearing me our next applicant is Michelle Berger good morning yep we can hear you good morning good morning sorry I'm having issues with my home office computer I'm not able to log in on Teams. I do have Zoom and Google um, Google Classroom and all these other apps going, trying to get my kids ready for school. And then, you know, I work from home a lot, so I use those other apps more often. So I figured I'd call in as well. All right, well, thank you for calling in. Thank you for your application. I will pose the two questions that I have first to you. One is, what do you see as the highest priority for this committee? And secondly, what is, would you perceive as your long-term vision for this committee? Okay, I believe that the highest priority would be to, uh, to um, maintain what we have um, as far as parks and recreation. Um, I've lived here for off and on most of my adult life of you know 20 years and I've seen the development in um, areas for families and for tourists alike and I, I, I think that as long as we, we um, maintain what we have and then um, with development um, to preserve if possible any of the natural habitat that is around um, I'm not sure what the committee has as far as background with uh, natural resource preservation, but I've seen a lot of um, the, the climate change being part of, um, of the local, local uh, tourism. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I thought somebody was saying something, but I, I see that... Uh, you know, they're getting away from more of the motorized things and using bikes and hiking trails and the kayaking. And it's, it's good to see the waterways being used without um, motorized um, uh, motorized vehicles. Um, and then for the um, long term, I, I think that being um, the lakes area, lakes proud, um, the, those slogans, I don't want to call them just slogans because I use them so much. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, um, not just scenic area for bringing tourists, but it's also a, a healthy place to live. I've, um, I grew up in the Mille Lacs area and just seeing what um, lots of people that um, converge at once um, can do as far as, um, you know, pollution and stuff like that. So if our area, I see that a lot of the garbage um, cans, I see that the parks and stuff are clean, and there's, there's a great pride in the area, and I'd like to just be part of what the, the mission statement for the, the Natural Advisory Board would be, and then just to, con you know, continue that and then, you know, ask our 
local people and then a tourist alike, what would they what they would like to see, what they use and encourage them to maintain a, a cleaner environment. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? Okay, I don't see any other commissioners wanting to ask questions at this time. Ms. Berger, so okay. with that, I want to thank you for your application and taking the time today to come before us and, and uh, answer the questions that have been posed. So remind you that the decision will be made next Tuesday, a week from today. And Great. I think that concludes our interviews for today. So thank you to all of you for being on board with us and, and applying for these positions. Thank you. Absolutely. Good luck to you. So the next item on the agenda is Brigadier General Lowell Cruz, who will give us an update on the Camp Ripley facility. I wonder if uh, we're at 9.30. At so at maybe 9:30. he's not here yet. So, so Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Sure. So. Okay, so we just went through that exercise. It's a chair appointment. Right. Are, do you want input from the other commissioners? Or? I sure will take it. I've no, gotten input I, from... I will just let you know that I'm, I haven't changed my mind. When I was chair, I was just at, the, at that meeting, I was going to appoint Chris Pence. So okay. I'm wanting him. Any other commissioners have... Thoughts, preferences? Uh, I will concur, I think, uh, uh, with Commissioner Coring, too, is that, you know, I really, you know, Chris ranked pretty high in, in my scoring, too. Okay. Well, as far as experience, uh, knowledge, uh, ability to jump in and hit the ground running, I think Chris obviously would. Uh, would be the best qualified person for that. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Mr. Chair, one more thing. I will sit over here so those two gentlemen can sit here. I think it would be just a lot easier for them. One, one second, Commissioner Coring. Is, is Rosemary going to, Commissioner Cor uh, Franzine going to come back out here? He is. Okay. Then otherwise I would have, could have come up here and sat. As far as I know. <laughs> Brigadier General Cruz. There's Commissioner Franzine. You guys want to come to the table? Are you ready? Yep. We are ready. And I'll have your PowerPoint up for you. So before you begin, I want to just take the quick opportunity to apologize for the technical difficulties we experienced last time you were Please. scheduled to be with us and appreciate you. It's perfect. Your willingness to so, come back um, and. Our army has been dealing with virtual <laughs> conferences for about, I don't know, 15 years or so. And, and I know exactly how frustrating it can be to get everybody on the same page. So I'm very happy to come here and um, meet in person with you. And, and um, continue to um, strive against some of the mania around the coronavirus. So excited to be here. Um, it, I'll, obviously, I'm Brigadier General Lowell Cruz. I'm the senior commander at Camp Ripley. And normally, we come and do this briefing to all our community partners in the spring. And in an attempt to tell you what's going on at Camp Ripley over the summer so that you can help us educate your your neighbors on what's going on at camp and why we're making noise or blocking roads and stuff like that with our trains and that. Obviously, I'm, I'll come and give this brief any time of the year because I love coming out and I love talking about Camp Ripley. And so um, 
you'll probably get to see me again, hopefully in person next March again. But, um, but right now we'll talk about what's happening at Camp Ripley in, in this crazy year of 2020, or what has happened. And um, we'll give you kind of an overview and then I'll let you continue your day. So thank you for having me. Next hey. slide. Oh, that's me. All right, sorry. Left, right, let's see. All right, there we go. So um, ladies and gentlemen, just like any organization, we spend a lot of time understand, trying to understand what we are and what we do and that creates a, a mission statement that we use to guide our activities. And, and Camp Ripley exists to do three things. It, um, we are a place where we bring in military forces to support the federal mission of preparing to be ready for our nation's worst day, be it in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Normandy Beach, wherever. Um, our primary mission is to train you know, members of the Department of Defense on being ready to, to do what our nation needs. But we also am a a very large training platform where we train National Guardsmen as well as civil, civilian agencies for our state's worst day as well. And obviously you saw some of that in May and Ju early June when we um, responded to help with the civil unrest in, in Minneapolis. And so um, we, have, you know, we have units that are dedicated for that kind of training and obviously next spring we're gonna include in this briefing a slide that talks about what is the process for getting your National Guard from their, their home into uniform and out supporting a civilian agency? Because I think that's important information for you to learn as well. And pro the third mission, part of my mission statement is to be the best neighbor I can be to our, my surrounding communities and that's driving my effort here today is um, to inform and to elicit support in having this gem of a military training base in central Minnesota. And, and obviously, you know, in the Brainerd Lakes area to um, make sure that we can continue to do the training we need in the first two parts of that mission and not sacrifice that with encroachment from people that are not, didn't realize they were living next to a military base. <laughs> so so um, we had some leadership changes. If you watched any of the news conferences last spring, you saw how dynamic um, my boss, General John Jensen, was as the adjutant general and helping the governor. Uh, yesterday, we installed a new adjutant general, and that is um, now Major General Sean Makey. He was also promoted yesterday. So he replaced John Jensen as our adjutant general. Um, that's because now Lieutenant General John Jensen took the job as the director of the Army National Guard. So he's out at Washington, D.C., where he is the, in charge of that intermediate headquarters between the Joint Chiefs and Minnesota that provides all the resources for the National Guard and all the policy. And so a pretty important job for him, and he supports all 54 states and territories in that job. His um, command sergeant major, now General Mankey's command sergeant major, is, is um, Brian Soper. He's new to, new to us in the last year as well. He um, was originally from the Mankato area, or the Moorhead area, and he, um, he spent the last 10 years out at National Guard Bureau, so he brings a lot of connectivity into um, the National Guard with, with relationships at the national level, which helps us a lot. We also in the last year have added a new, um, new division commander. That's um, my soon to be Major General Mike Wickman, a good friend of mine. I deployed with him in 2004. And his command sergeant major is Mike Whitehead. And Mike's significant in the organization because he's also the national commander of the disabled American veterans. And so we continue to connect both up and down throughout our organization. And then finally, I'm the only familiar face on any of these slides. I've been in the position now for three years. And um, I um, installed a new um, garrison commander. So uh, it, it's a, not a strange relationship, but I am the, a, I work for Major General Mankey as one of his assistant tags. And, but my headquarters and my office is at Camp Ripley. And then I have a garrison commander who is a traditional soldier, and that individual right now is Josh Seimer. And so Josh is the colonel in charge of the garrison at Camp Ripley, and he comes and drills just like any other soldier once a month. 
and to do those activities. And then we're both supported by a full-time Command Sergeant Major, Marcus Erickson, who joined me on base. So now I, I used to joke that I was the only permanent resident on Camp Ripley, but now there's two homes filled with people. So that's kind of cool too. So our economic impact over the last, in 2019 was fairly significant and really hasn't changed a lot from year to year. We hover around that $120 million of direct impact. And you know we, we like to think that that hovers around $300 million of, of actual impact into the communities. And um, I forgot the number, but I think in the Brainerd community alone, I think there's like 160 of my full-time employees that live in your, in your city. And so um, Brainerd's a pretty good place for them to, to headquarter out of, pardon me. And so, um, you know, as we've talked before, this, this number varies a lot by the amount of construction on the installation in 2019. Um, saw some moderate construction, but not as much as in other years, and you'll find that under the projects line. So um, we continue to do some renovation every year, and this year we've got a lot of renovation going on in the installation. We're working on our railroad and a bunch of other projects that we'll talk about. So some highlights for 2019, um, we hovered around the same amount of usage that we normally see. Our civilian usage continued to grow, so 60,000 man days of civilians training on the installation, and we have yet to reach the point where there's conflict with the military training. We can normally fit them in. Um, our department, our, our environmental team once again competed at the national level and all the way up to the Department of Defense level and won the Natural Resources Award again. So we'll talk about that in the future slide. We held the, we hosted the second brigade of the 34th Infantry Division. They're an Iowa brigade and they had about 3,000 soldiers there last summer for training. And, um, and during that training, Lieutenant General James, who is the head of the First Army, um, came in and and visited them. And then this last winter, we spent a lot of time with our own armor brigade doing winter gunnery. So you probably heard a little more noise out of Camp Ripley in the January, February time than you're used to seeing. For us, we learned that, you know, we, we worked on our techniques of how to spread sand and things like that so our tanks could actually maneuver on ice and turn and stuff like that. And unfortunately, with the, the training cycle they're in, we'll probably see more of that. So we're trying to figure out how do we build things like indoor um, wash facilities and stuff like that so we can wash a tank and get it dried down so that we can store it without it freezing again. And so to enable that gunnery in the winter. So we had a couple of visits by some local congressmen, both Dean Phillips and Pete Stauber visited. And then um, we supported the deployment of the 34th ECAB as well. So, and finally, um, we received three new f fire trucks. And um, our fire department on the camp has got a, a, um, a mutual aid agreement with all the different community fire departments. And this last year, between their, their support of their Gold Cross ambulance and their fire calls, they, they responded to 225 calls off the base. And so what I think is really significant about that in our brief is that um, for people around Fort Ripley who are a long ways from any fire station, that gives them a capability that hopefully allows them to decrease their insurance rates a little bit as well because they do have a fire department that's closer than what was before. So, hmm. so COVID-19 had an impact on our installation um, starting in March, no different than anybody else. We spent a lot of um, March through May was really quiet on the installation. We barely had anybody but the normal, and even our normal um, full-time force, a good portion of it learned how to work from home. But um, we really did not see any training units until um, the first part of June. And so we learned, um, you know, the techniques we need to do inside of our housing units to keep them clean between soldiers. Um, in, in June, we had a, a battalion from Iowa that came that did a very poor job at doing COVID mitigation before they came. And so 
while they were at Camp Ripley, they had an outbreak that cost them about 200 soldiers that they had to send back to Iowa that were sick or exposed. Out of 500 soldiers, that's, you know, that really became a training distractor for them. The opposite of that, in July, we had a battalion come in from Indiana that spent a lot of time on the front end doing some really good um, um, screening of their soldiers, and they left a bunch back in Indiana, but they were able to bring 700 kids here, and they didn't have one case the whole two weeks they were here. So those are kind of two extremes of what I've experienced this summer, as well as we were the home for the testing of our Armor Brigade combat team. They went to the National Training Center in July, and so before they went to the National Training Center over the July 4th weekend and the following 10 days, they all came to Camp Ripley and all were individually tested for COVID. Out of that testing of about 4,000 soldiers, we found um, 58 soldiers that were positive and asymptomatic. So that test allowed us to strip them out of the formation and isolate them and allowed that formation to go to California and really not be affected by COVID and its training. And we were the first element in the Army to go and do a major training exercise. And that occurred in late July, early August, and um, was very successful. And a lot of planning went into it in the whole realm we live in right now of mitigating COVID. And obviously, we became a distribution center for the state's response for COVID as well. We had a stockpile of PPE that we um, gave to the state initially, and um, that helped a lot in the, the lack of N95 masks and gowns initially in the initial response. And then since the state act, since the state act of duty started for us in the April timeframe, we have been managing a PPE warehouse for the state. We've been providing the personnel, the logistics personnel that understand how to run a warehouse, and they've been providing that support to the state constantly, as well as we've had up to 10, I think it's down to like two now, mobile testing teams that were out testing um, long-term long healthcare facilities for COVID throughout the year. And so they've tested almost, I think, it's close to 80,000 people now is with that effort. So back to some good news about Camp Ripley. Um, we are completing some construction on the installation that we're excited about. Uh, we are in the process of replacing our 10 huts with the buildings you see in the upper left there. That's what we're calling longhouses. They're essentially the same square footage of a 10 hut, but it's now a CMU building. And what's good about it is it also has heating and cooling, so it's got HVAC systems. So we'll be able to use those buildings now year-round, which is important as we continue to try to expand how much year-round housing we have on the installation. Currently, I have about 4,000 um, beds total on the installation. And, no, I say again, about 8,000 beds total on the installation, but of only about 4,000 of them are year-round housing, and I'm trying to grow that. On the upper right there is one of the final buildings that we re had out of the effects from the 2016 tornado that came through. They knocked down, took the roof off of that building, and they, so they completely rebuilt the whole building. And that's what we call a T building. That's one of our barracks. And then the lower right there is one of the smaller buildings that we received out of that $22 million of milk con that uh, we were able to harvest at the end of the year to rebuild those buildings affected by the tornado. Some other construction and improvements on the installation. Um, we renovated what was a heavy equipment maintenance building. Um, the building in the upper left with all the garage bays now holds the Camp Ripley Fire Department. And they have about, I don't know, 10 to 12 shiny red trucks in there. Full-time fire department, about 15 members in that team right now. And they will probably continue to grow as the funding comes in. But um, what that gives me is four firefighters 24 seven on the installation. We also have a cooperative agreement with, with um, Mail Clinic that was Gold Cross and now it's Mail Ambulance Service. So they've stationed one of their ambulances in that building and my firefighters are also employees from Mail Clinic. And so when the one ambulance that's in Little Falls goes out on a call, they become the backup ambulance for that response. Lower left there are a picture of some of the generators we're putting on the installation. We have three major substations on the installation, 
and we are putting very large generators at all those substations as, as backup power for the substations. Um, that project will be complete, the generator part will be complete this fall. Next year, we'll, in, we'll purchase the computer control system, the SCADA system that will allow us to balance the load on the installation amongst those generators. And then we'll truly be at a point where we can become an island um, off the grid and um, we'll, we'll have our 60 acre solar field as a potential source of electricity during the day and then generators in the evening. And so, you know, as long as I can pump diesel fuel into them generators, we'll be, you know, an island in the storm and in one of Minnesota's worst days if that was to occur. And then finally, in the lower right, our, our post exchange renovated that whole building, the, the AFES Corporation that is, provides the Army Air Force exchange system redid their building and um, looks pretty nice and modern and, and um, uh, is a good refresh. So. In 2020, we had a bunch of sched train scheduling and it was a fairly light summer for us, especially, you know, we, we basically had three battalion formations that came through Camp Ripley. Um, June, July, and August. The last one was the 151 Field Artillery it was there last week. And so I, I know you were probably heard some of the artillery firing that they were doing that. Um, we probably, the source of the most of our noise complaints was that. Unfortunately, with the lack of training, once again, we instill in our public that, you know, this is a quiet place to live and sometimes it isn't. So. Um, but we were the home of a very large rail movement again. We moved about 20, 220 military vehicles, uh, wheeled vehicles out of Camp Ripley and another 200 track out of Camp Ripley in support of the um, brigade's trip to the National Training Center. So that was on the way out was about nine trains worth of cars. And um, on the way back, due to the rail improvements we've done around Camp Ripley, we could reduce that to six trains. And so we spent about a million dollars fixing the rail around the entrance of Camp Ripley. And then there is a short piece of track that runs north along the Veterans Cemetery there. And we renovated that track. And because of that renovation, it gave us the capability of putting 30 cars there. And so now I could take 90 car trains instead of the 60s that we were limited to before. We're also spending another a little over a million dollars on a rail siding um, further down that rail line as you move towards Little Falls. And that mile long rail siding will allow us now to bring two trains in at Camp Ripley. And um, my goal there is to be able to load two trains a day. And it, it will, because of that, we, if we can meet that goal, we'll reduce the rail load timeline for our armor brigade from 10 days down to about three and that's pretty significant in the national defense response piece. So this fall, we, we continue to plan on seeing the most of our law enforcement come in September and October and do a lot of their in-service and a lot of their fall training. Um, we were going to be the home to the MnDOT snowplow training like normal, and then COVID shut that off, and then they decided to do it at a later date. And we had other people take up that training space, so they lost that this year, but they'll be back next year, and they plan on doing some of their snowplow training in the cities this year. And then finally, um, we, we'll talk about it on a future slide, but we are the home to the, both the DNR and the, the State Patrol Academies. So. Um, our Air Guard continues both the Reserve and National Guard continue to use Camp Ripley extensively on its runway. On any given day, you can find two to three C-130s swirling around Camp Ripley doing touch and goes. And um, that is, this summer is, you know, that used to be one or two days a week, but because they couldn't train in, a, in you know, March through May, um, their frequency there now this year has been you know, almost every day, all summer long. So a lot more training flights, as well as um, we we continue to bring in outstate units to use our dirt strip that's there as well. We have one of the only dirt strips in the inventory that's certified for C-130s to train on. And so um, 
we'll see units from Arizona or California. And the latest, I think, was Maine that was over here doing some training on the dirt strip as they prepare to go to Afghanistan. And I talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, we, we continue to have full-time partners on the installation, the HSCM, the DNR, and the State Patrol are three great partners, and we're working right now to move them all into one consolidated building on the installation. Um, I think the value that they're gonna get out of that is they're gonna quickly learn that a lot of them do the same types of training, and maybe they can combine that effort rather than having three separate efforts. But, um, and then once again, next fall, I hope once again to see the snowplow drivers training at Ripley. And um, I, hope, I hope we don't have all the snow they predict this winter because um, they'll be less trained. So. We did a lot of things over the last year as community outreach. At last September, we had a big weekend at Camp Ripley. We revealed the last painting in the, in the five painting group that was done for the State Veterans Cemetery. Um, the artist Charles Kapsner's painting for the Air Force was revealed. And we did that in conjunction with our Camp Ripley open house. And then the open house was used as a platform to thank and um, emphasize the, the con contribution of the Air National Guard to the Minnesota. And so we had a bunch of those folks as part of that ceremony. Um, the picture in the right there in the middle is a picture of the group of kids that we had for a very cool event with the Indian tribes called Planting for the Future. And so the, the Indian schools that surround us um, brought their, their high school age kids there. And we had a day of sharing cultural experiences between the two organizations. We learned a little bit more from the military kids that participated. They learned a little bit more about the Native American culture, specifically the Ojibwe. And for us, it gave us a chance to have a recruiting station there. Um, their elders always want to try to figure out ways to get, um, you know, to help their youth and forward their abilities and joining the military is one of the ways that they know that they can do that. And so it was a great event. Um, we, we centered it around some environmental work of planting some native grasses and things like that. And so um, we'll continue to do it and let it grow a little bit in the future. Obviously, COVID came and kicked my butt on that this year as well, so we haven't held it this year, but um, we're planning for the future on that as well. So, And then um, we, we had a, a plethora of our outdoor um, um, events as well last year, um, trolling for the troops, uh, good, good to disabled American veteran turkey and deer hunts as well as the lower right picture there, we, we um, dedicated some of our off-site property as gr grouse hunting areas and working with the Grouse Federation. And so a um, pretty cool project there as well. So Finally, our environmental program continues to lead the Department of Defense in its quality and the, the, the kind of programming they do. Um, so in 2019, they won the Natural Resources Conservation Award at the Department of Defense level for a large um, installation. And um, it's just, it truly tells me that uh, the quality of the people I've got working there. The picture is of a golden eagle that they captured. They, we've now captured, I think, four of the golden eagles that live around Camp Ripley in the, in the winter. And they, they put trackers on those golden eagles and they were summer in the, Arctic Circle way up in the Yukon. And so when they go south, they go to Camp Ripley. So it's um, kind of a cool program to see. And one of the few pieces of research where there really wasn't a lot of research on just what was the, the world of a golden eagle. So kind of cool. So With um, a great environmental team comes a lot of environmental oversight as well. Um, as a large, you know, state-run installation, we obviously are reviewed by the Department of Defense as well as the state as well as county. And um, my environmental team is, leads the charge in keeping us out of trouble in those realms as well. And so that's just kind of a laundry list of all the different um, elements that come and make sure that we're protecting Camp Ripley for the future. And so with that great environmental team comes a lot of partnerships that make it happen. Um, the border soil and water and the conservation um, 
Nature Conservatory, our very important partners as we administer the ACUB program, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and a lot of our research. And um, the picture on the lower right there is of some of our different research projects, as well as um, in the middle there, we cleaned up one of our ranges and harvested a dump truck full of aluminum from the rounds that we shoot on our tank ranges. So, And so our prescribed burning this last year, this was what we were planning to do over the summer. And the good news is because of COVID, when we didn't have anything going on in Ripley in April, we had one of our best burning seasons ever. And so all those things in the picture got burned when they were supposed to. Um, about 15,000 acres of, of land that we burn every year. And out of that is probably, um, well, most of it is to prevent fires come from leaving our ranges and endangering somebody's home. But we also do some fire, um, at, use it fire as a way of managing the land as well. So. Finally, the ACUB program continues to be a success for, story for us. Um, we've got a lot of press over the last year with the project that we did with the city of Baxter um, you know, along the Nokasippi there. Um, so to date, you know, in 19, about $42 million worth of federal funding. We've matched that with about $14 million of state funding. and. Um, we still have a lot of land with, with interested landowners that want to enroll their land, so that's positive. Uh, we're currently working with the, the Minnesota Power to understand the way forward for the Sullivan Lake Dam. Um, that, that dam's been there for almost 100 years, and uh, Minnesota Power would like to you know, um, do something with it. And so they're in conversation with us on that, and we're trying to understand how we can um, protect the land that's associated with that dam from encroachment as well. So, finally, ladies and gentlemen, that's a picture of my great team that helps me run Camp Ripley on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'd love to answer any questions you have of me. Thank you, General Cruz. The question I have is you talked about 58 soldiers being sent back to Iowa. Uh, yeah, about 200, actually, yes, sir. Were yep. there... Uh, out of 500, you said, is that so, correct? Out of 500? Yeah. Yes, sir. How does that impact the training of those 200? Well, they, um, it, it wrecked their training plan. So, you know, they, so they were about eight days into their, nah, about seven, yeah, about eight days into their two weeks training when they started to see some sick kids. And so they sent some kids to the St. Gabe's Hospital and they, tested positive and so then they did contact tracing and the next day sent like 60 kids to St. Gabe's to get tested and the Morrison County emergency manager threw up the flag because you know at that time St. Gabe's could only test about 50 people a day so we overwhelmed the local hospital and its ability to to do testing that week. Um, they did a good job from that point on of contact tracing and isolation and stuff like that, but it, they left two days early and took the whole battalion back to Iowa two days early because COVID had just become all they were dealing with. So they quit or, you know, they basically quit and went home. And um, so it was a testament of a outbreak that really, you know, became a training distractor for them. I'm impressed with every report I've heard when I was on the city council in Baxter and the reports I've heard here at the county level with the impact that you guys have, not just in our local area, in our, you know, our Little Falls, Brainerd, Baxter area, that, but nationally, yeah. that this camp is recognized under DOD and, and the other organizations as superior and your efforts in the ACUB process is superior and you're out there I know uh, Mr. Holman personally and his efforts to capture the dollars to yep. increase that, but also the partnership with you folks and that has been tremendous there. So yeah. appreciate that. We do everything we can to educate our national congressional team as well as our state team on the importance of a government. You know, because in reality, it's it's those dollars are flowing right into our community and helping you know, some landowners that normally don't get that kind of support. So that's, that's pretty important to me as well. So, 
Yeah. And, it, and it's a great program because it mutually benefits me to make sure. <laughs> You need more pockets. I think my, yeah. <laughs> I think my car insurance is, needs to, or the warranty needs to be reviewed. So, but um, excuse me for that. So, any, any other questions? Any questions from other commissioners? No. But thank you so much for your service. Also. Yeah. That's well, we're we're proud to. We're pretty proud of the team in June. You know, we um, there were kids that pulled up stakes. Uh, I had two battalions that were training at Camp Ripley, training to go to NTC. I had all their stuff loaded to go to NTC and we had to break all that down and move them to the cities and they did that in about 12 hours. And so that was a pretty good response. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a best job in the Army. So thank you. <laughs> So. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it, and thank you for coming back a second yeah. time. No, no, no apologies needed. So <laughs> I, I understand completely the tyranny of technology. So, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. You have a great day. through at 9.56, so one second ago. <laughs> Thank you. I think we'll get, wait just a minute for Commissioner Hogue to return. Okay, Gary, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Good morning, uh, Chair and Commissioners. I thought I'd start with just a little bit of um, refresher, if we can, uh, when it comes to uh, ski trail grooming. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the county has groomed uh, two ski trails in this uh, county uh, for over 30 years. Um, last year, uh, at a budget committee meeting, it was decided not to purchase updated equipment and uh, to move forward with um, discontinuing uh, ski trail grooming. Uh, so that's the way that we had uh, uh, moved at a, a previous uh, county board meeting. Um, some folks from the ski trail um, uh, club uh, with uh, Commissioner Hogue uh, had some um, concerns again and had a request for a potential $5,000 a year uh, investment in to continue that operation. And at the same time, we're going through kind of a transition at the landfill with our longtime solid waste coordinator going to be retiring uh, and how better uh, to try to transition and serve our, our customers at the landfill with the uptick in recycling, electronics, mattresses and stuff. Uh, I felt pr um, that it, it could be, um, the stars maybe have a line to have a discussion on how to better serve our, our customers, our community at um, a better value long term and potentially also uh, do the ski trail grooming at the same time. And so what I have uh, in front of you 
is uh, two, two boxes, and this is, it comes down to the, basically how this would work dollars and cents wise. Uh, the first thing I would want to say is that um, while these are, all of this money here is taxpayer money, none of this is levy dollars. It's all non-levy. But I do stress that we do treat this all, it is taxpayer money, so we've got to spend wisely, and I think we all agree with that. Uh, the top box is equipment needed. Uh, the biggest piece there is a side-by-side -side that would have tracks. Um, but I want to stress that we believe that um, while we would use that for grooming, actually we have a, a very significant need for a better way to do our business with getting loggers out to um, potential sales. And uh, we have the location of our HHW building and our electronics and matches isn't ideal. It's about a mile between the two. And to have three-quarter or one-ton trucks running back and forth, having a, a lot smaller um, uh, UTV, if you will, could be uh, of great value for that operation as well. Uh, so I would argue that that's needed irregardless of potential um, consideration of grooming, but it is in here and that would be one of its primary things in the winter if, if that was to do. The Ginzo Groomer, uh, we estimate about 10,000, but you'll see that we had $5,500 that we did sell all of our old equipment. So basically by replacing that, it would be about a $4,500 cost. The last groomer we had roughly was about 30 years. Uh, we've had it 25, 30 years. So if you figure 4,500 over just 20 years, it's about a cost to the county of about $225 for that piece of equipment, if you choose to do that. Uh, but the big numbers, so that would be equipment. Any questions on equipment while we're, we're on that, while we're just kind of walking through this? Any questions, Commissioner Coring? So when we get into uh, the larger costs, the staff, this is where uh, part of it is we can, um, increase our effectiveness, our, our, our service to our customers. We, we've been uh, training and grooming Ryan Simonson to really take over the full-time direction of the landfill when uh, Doug Morris, our solid waste coordinator, retires. There's a big financial piece slash uh, reporting to the MPCA and a lot of things out there. You, oh, you almost can think about any little thing that comes through the door there or the gate has to be accounted for. And so it's not rocket science, but it takes a lot of time to keep that stuff. And of course, we have an operator that helps with some of that, but we do all the actual reporting to the state. So we have a, a business manager to, that's going to take on some of those responsibilities. But one of the things that has um, starting to uh, ski trails aside on this is the amount of recycling, the amount of mattresses, the amount of electronics, uh, and uh, HHW um, has really uh, ramped up uh, this last year, recycling indirectly from potentially other sites being uh, limited and closed uh, is bringing more to the landfill, and it's bringing more up to the ideal uh, transfer station. The deal with the ideal transfer station is we go up and we take all the electronics and, and um, uh, they, we used to only go up there, you know, maybe once or twice a month, and now it's almost weekly. That's how much they've picked up. And so while we have two folks out there, um, you can imagine um, when somebody's gone, the potential for contamination with the recycling when there's not a lot of, um, there's monitoring, but it's not like it uh, could be potentially. And we're running about two to 300 a month in contamination costs still with the recycling that we have at the landfill. It's still a problem. It's better than if it's an unmonitored site, but it's still, it's still there. Uh, so the proposal really is to, um, you can see that for 2020, it's roughly about 227,000 to run our operations this year. Uh, next year, the proposal would be not to hire a, a seasonal uh, temporary staff, but to actually invest in another full-time um, technician um, uh, there. So our cost would go up while we still had the solid waste coordinator uh, on uh, the payroll until October. And then what you can see in 2022 is that we would have enhanced customer service, better operations for a cheaper price uh, long term. 
That's including ski trail grooming. That's including um, uh, a lot more activity at the, at the landfill site and better equipment for our foresters to help get loggers on the sites to show them properties to sell more, hopefully, timber. I know that was a lot thrown there. There's, and I'm here for the questions. Hmm. Any questions from commissioners? Commissioner Coring? Well, first I want to just say to Gary, thanks, because you always seem to try to think outside of the box, which is a good thing, but I don't agree with this. We've already had this discussion. Commissioner Brecken, Commissioner Barrows was opposed to this, to the, uh, of the um, grooming of trails, and then all of a sudden it's back at us. I did have a con conversation with the Brainerd Snowdio Club who groomed the snowmobile trails. I don't know if you know, they have pull tabs in several places in the county to raise money for their club. They have meat raffles, they have bingo. It's an all volunteer operation to groom the trails here for snowmobiles. And in talking to them, they said, well, if the county's gonna start hiring staff and buying equipment, we'll be the next ones standing right here saying, why should we even volunteer anymore? Why should we have pull tabs? We'll just let the county do the grooming for us and buy the equipment and staff do it. So I, I just don't understand why we're back in the grooming business when we've already made this decision. It seems kind of political to me uh, right when the election's close. Um, that's what it smells like to me. So I, I'm not gonna support this. So Commissioner Coring, to your point, and, and you are correct in your summary of what took place earlier, would you look at the side-by-side the -side as a separate issue for land services? Forget the grooming at this point? Is that something you would consider or other commissioners? I'm just thinking of dividing it out and what is the asset that would I, I understand what Gary's doing. I and I'm I if you know trying to run his operation, I think that he's got an operation that has so many wheels turning, the landfill, birth certificates, marriage license, death certificates, planning and zoning. It's just you know, I understand that he's trying to keep the wheels on. I just don't understand why we're in the grooming business. I just, I don't agree with that. And, okay, uh, but my question was, forget the grooming. We're not going to, just dis all right. for a discussion, let's assume there's not going to be any grooming. All right. And so that means the position that was requested is not there. We're just talking about a piece of machinery. And would that bring the ability for the staff at Land Services to do their job less expensively? Is that something that you would support or think about? But, uh, but it almost seems like you're, you're wanting to get a, a nose under the tent where you, you buy the side-by-side -side and then all of a sudden you have the side-by-side -side and say, oh, I guess we've got a side-by-side. -side. All we need is something to pull behind it to groom the trails and we're in business. Well, I don't agree with you there because we're talking about a position and we're talking about a piece of machinery to pull behind it. So I'm taking those out of the picture just for discussion purposes here, and I understand what you're saying about the nose under the tent, but is there a need for land services to have that piece of equipment for their current responsibilities? I don't know. Ask Gary, I guess. I don't know. Is there a need for that piece of equipment? But it seems like the only reason that we're here today is because Commissioner Hogue, who, well, Commissioner Hogue is bringing us back up about grooming when we already made this decision that we weren't going to groom trails anymore. Well, I, I would just pipe in there. You know, I did ask Gary to look at this piece of equipment simply because it, it would potentially help the staff be more efficient with their current responsibilities. 
aside from grooming. Yes, if he needs that for to run the operation for forestry management or whatever it would be, I'm not opposed to that. Okay. I just just don't want to be in the grooming business. Right. And I and I understand. Period. That. So I mean, just think about that, Mr. Chairman, about the snowmobile club. What, what are you going to do if the snowmobile club comes up here and says, you know what, we've got buildings over here, we've got groomers, very expensive groomers, and they come and they say, well, we want the county to take over this, and we want county staff to be grooming these trails rather than volunteers. So if we're doing this, how could we deny them? Well, I would only go to the grant and aid program, and I realize one of these trails has a grant and aid attachment to it, but the county supported that grant and aid, not mm -hmm. the, the Nordic Ski Club. The other one does not have anything attached to it in terms of grant and aid, so those are outside dollars that come to us. But I'm trying to separate the piece of equipment from a responsibility that talks about grooming. So I'm only, my question was only to talk about the piece of equipment and the, is that a, a piece of equipment that's going to enhance the staff at land services to do their job? Well, I don't understand why you're separating that off, Mr. Chair. Why? Because we buy, you know, do we, how do I say this? The original, it all got skewed when we started talking about grooming, Commissioner Coring. Right. Buying a piece of equipment doesn't necessarily have anything to do with grooming. It can have to do with the efficiency of a department and their ability to do the job better, their ability to perhaps take potential buyers of, of uh, the trees and that out there for the forest management program. I understand so, what you're saying. So but I, that's why it, so I'm only talking about the side-by-side, -side, not But I thought today was the conversation about grooming. It says right on there, that's to buy that side-by-side -side and the grooming equipment. I thought that's what this conversation, we know what this conversation is about today. It's about the county doing the grooming. Okay, so I understand that. Right? That, well, that's what the agenda says. So I'm gonna let Gary speak just for a second okay. here. Go ahead, Gary. Okay. Um, at the last, uh, I don't remember if it was the last county board or the one before, I, I, I apologize. <clears throat> but when the ski uh, club was here, they were requ requesting $5,000 uh, to assist in their efforts to groom the trails. I felt it was prudent uh, to at least share a potential idea with what everything else is going on in our department to say, if you're going to consider 5,000 to the ski club, which I, that's what they were asking for at the time. Is there a different way we potentially could, if you were going to potentially give them the 5,000 for grooming, that we could continue on, because our, you know, as long as I've worked in land service, we've always done this grooming. So that's a little bit different. I think a lot of people maybe didn't realize we've been doing this grooming for a long time, maybe. But that um, with what's happening with a potential retirement and where the where we already have a seasonal that we budget for which has been budgeted as long as I've been around to go and clean the parks help kill the weeds uh, mow some uh, areas potentially uh, for uh, at our parks or our trails or tax forfeited lots that we could be more flexible and still continue grooming absolutely and have, a, have just um, a better experience for staff and our customers. But yes, I've tied that to the grooming. But I will tell you, even if you say, you know, yeah, we don't wanna do the grooming, there's a huge need out there. We have some awesome parks. Right now we're going about once a week to clean them. Wouldn't it be great if we could get out there twice a week um, and make sure that every time we have a, a busy holiday coming up that the, the restrooms are spick and span, We've walked the trails, all the garbage and weeds are, are, are clean. We could do that better at a lower cost. Um, but yes, the reason today was because I wanted you guys to consider a potential model than just giving 5,000 a year to the ski club for the grooming. So I just wanted to hear you know, this proposal. Mr. Oh, Chair, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. In in regards to the you know the five thousand dollars, 
Wasn't the uh, ski club willing to do the grooming themselves? They just need, they were going to just get some financial assistance and then that's, they were going to do the grooming. Th that's correct. And that would be, you know, like whatever their quest was to do. Yeah, I believe they asked for 5000 and they would do the grooming. Okay. okay. And then they would, they would handle the grooming. Okay. Commissioner Hogue. Uh, Mr. Chair, one, th this is not political. Um, this is a commissioner doing the job that, uh, that they're elected to do. I was approached by the ski club and many, many community members uh, in my district that, that use ski trails, uh, that draws visitors to our county for ski trails. It, it, it does have an economic uh, uh, ed, uh, opportunity for our area. It is spelled out clearly in our comprehensive plan as far as recreational activities. It, you know, it's something we've done for years. That discussion doesn't belong at a budget meeting as, as it was uh, determined to, to get out of that business. Um, again, there, there's really two options here. Um, I, I, I do, uh, for the, for the uh, constituents that I represent as well as some of uh, other district uh, that, that have, have uh, spoke in favor of continuing grooming, uh, support the grooming of these trails as well as even expansion of, of cross-country ski trails um, and, and there's two options here there's two options here yes the club is uh, is shy five thousand uh, uh, dollars to, to continue doing it themselves uh, that being the forty five hundred or whatever of, of grant and aid dollars plus the five thousand there are a number of of recreational activities that we support through the sales, through our timber sales and land sales. $5,000 is, is quite frankly a fairly small amount con compared to some of the others that we do. I mean, if we're gonna start picking apart uh, uh, recreational activities, we're gonna have nothing for Crow Wing County for people to come here and, and recreate and spend their dollars. Uh, this is just one that uh, I think deserved more input at, at a board level than, than at a budget meeting. Gary then took this, I think, with his long vision uh, uh, planning as, as an opportunity to maybe present to us a, a long-term version of this and continue to do this, uh, this activity. Um, so w really the way I see this, we have two options. One is to, to uh, look at financial support for the club, which they're more than willing to do, or two, get back into this business and, and not only utilize the, the, the uh, equipment that, that Gary's proposing uh, as a year-round uh, piece of equipment rather than a seasonal um, and, and a fairly, fairly small investment with the long-term vision of saving some money in that department. So uh, I just want to make it clear that I'm, I'm here speaking for the people that have, have, have approached me uh, with concerns of dropping it completely. Commissioner Franzine, did did you have anything? Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, we did have this discussion uh, at the budget committee meeting because that's where we were deciding whether or not to buy $36,000 worth of equipment. That is the appropriate committee to have this discussion at. And then if you remember, correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Franzine, we did have this discussion on whether or not to keep grooming the trails at the environment uh, committee yes. twice. So it has been vetted and it has been talked about several times. So Gary, is there any reason that we wouldn't bring the side-by-side -side as a, an equipment request from your department? The $5,000, 5,500 that we realized off the sale could be given to the club. They take over all the issues with that to groom, that buys a year. And I'll be real frank, I'm disappointed that, you know, this discussion started last October and we made our feelings known at that point, to Commissioner Coring's point, and here we sit in October a year later and we're addressing grooming again. And I'm not against doing something, but I have a difficult time when we're, st when we're gonna be potentially adding a, a staff. And I under, realize, or I do understand that none of this is levy dollars, but it's still dollars that are being spent out there. But in terms of getting through this year, if we gave the club 
to $5,500. And that was talked about, you know, could, would we do something just financially, not in terms of our labor, not in terms of equipment, but just help them get through because the one trail, is it Wolf or Long? Which one's not a grant and aid? Wolf. Wolf. To assist them in dealing with that one. So, because we would pass through the other 4,000 that we get in the grant and aid for the other trail. Isn't that a possibility? Then we're not tying that side by side to any grooming. And then in the next year, if something else gets worked out, because we know the budget for this year, even though it's not levy dollars, everything is critical this year because of the COVID stuff. So we want to be real careful in how we spend these dollars. But would that be an option that we could do? Well, absolutely. And it, is it your understanding that the Nordic Ski Club would be in favor of that? I mean, that's sort of what we heard early on in, in the discussion at the Natural Resources. Is that uh, accurate it, to say that? Uh, from Mr. Franzine or oh. Coring? We never had, we never had, Mr. Chair, we never had that discussion about giving them extra money at the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. We, I don't ever recall having that discussion there. Okay. I think this is just something that came forward because of Commissioner Hogue. And I think that they, it sounds like it was a, from them, with, with the $4,000, I believe they're getting grant and aid of 4000 right, Gary? Uh, yeah, 41 or 4200 I believe. And then they wanted an additional $5,500. I think they wanted like $9,000. Correct. They yeah. felt was needed to take care of that trail. Yeah, and I, I believe they're looking for a commitment every year, not just a one-time uh, donation. Well, at, at this point, my point is that we've had a year to kind of sort these things out, and we haven't gotten to that point, and so... That's disappointing to me that we've taken 12 months almost to get nowhere. And so if it's a one-year opportunity, then I'm not afraid to say that that's what it is, and we'll figure out if there's something going forward from that point. But we would have to be very honest with them about whether we're willing to do that or not, because to Commissioner Coring's point, if we do it for one, do we do it for all? although there are grant and aid dollars for some trails that other trails don't qualify for. But I know that we also provide some, some uh, assistance up in the Cross Lake area on the Big Island up there. So we do get involved in some of the trails and, and recreational opportunities around the county. So it's not that, that we don't do that. Commissioner just, Coring? Mr. Chair, just to let you know that I do not support giving that $5,500. And before um, yourself and Commissioner Brecken got on here, there used to be, um, there's a whole list of, of organizations that we give money to. I can remember there was a, Rosemary, help me, I believe there was a one-time deal of $20,000 to the Senior Center. And they wanted it to be ongoing. And believe me, I'm a member over here, and it's a worthy, worthy cause. Where do you draw the line? I mean, you can keep giving away the taxpayers' dollars. You know, ask Rosemary sometime about her mother. Everybody laughs about me about Grandma Johnson. Ask her about her mother, how much she's living on, $1,000 a month, living in her own house, paying her taxes. When her taxes go up $200 a year, Rosemary said she's going to have to start helping her pay her property taxes. Think about that next time you make a decision. Well, I understand what you're saying, Commissioner Coring, but these are not levy dollars, so it won't, Im tax dollars. It, it won't impact their, their property taxes. And Commissioner Frenzy. Um, I talked to you once, and I know we checked with the DNR, and it isn't a big issue to make the other trail a grant and aid trail, right? Can you explain that a little bit? Sure, there, there is an application process. We were going to move forward with making Wolf Lake also grant and aid, uh, but we, we did stop that process. Um, it was indicated uh, to us from the DNR that there wouldn't, even though Wolf Lake would become grant and aid, there was no more money to uh, be had 
However, we felt, you know, um, it would just kind of clear some things up and keep everything on when potential a few years maybe go by and people want to have more discussion on this that one isn't grant and aid and one is. Um, but we decided it would make it maybe more clear in the future, but we did stop to not do that. Well, it's my opinion, and it's my opinion only, but I think it should be made grant and aid in case there are extra dollars ever out there, then we can apply for it. I wouldn't disagree with that. I think okay. that, that any of those opportunities... Uh, then, then in my understanding, the club has, has talked to the DNR about that, and as Gary stated, they're, they're not... There are no more grant and aid dollars there for, for right those. There are right now, but there may be in the future. Um, so, the, the, you know, again, the club's hope is to, uh, even if it's a, a one-year deal, is to, to have something in place to continue grooming of these trails for this season. And as you said, we could continue this uh, conversation uh, and, and maybe look for more long-term. Uh, again, I, I just... Uh, I'm struggling with this as it's spelled out clearly in our in our plans. Uh, the 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 willingness to just throw it out, uh, even though we we do uh, have it in black and white that uh, this is something we do and have done. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think in the in the big picture for Crowing County, one of the you know the biggest revenue driver we have are the tourist dollars that come out there. And I realize when it comes to <coughs> cross country skiing. It's difficult to quantify some of those because people will come for a day and, and leave. So we don't know if they spend the dollars in Crowing County or not. But what we do know is that if we don't provide opportunities for people, and I'm not talking just about cross-country steam, I'm talking about how do we build our county roads for the ATV groups and for um, snowmobile groups in the winter, but road bikers, you know, in the warmer weather. So there's this whole host of opportunities to make Crowing County a destination county and they all drive revenue and if the expense and, and this happens to be the one where it's difficult to equate the revenues that may be there to the expenses that the county recognizes but we have to make sure I believe in my vision for this county that we provide the opportunities to make sure that people want to come to Crowing County if we don't, they will go to St. Louis County or over to the Alexandria area, the Detroit Lakes area. There are other counties that are competing against us for these tourist dollars, and we have to make sure that we invest wisely, but we also have to make sure that we understand that the comprehensive plan talks about these kinds of issues. You know, it's also the forest management, the AIS programs we have, every one of them creates an environment where people want to come to Crowing County. And we have to make sure that we are taking advantage of those opportunities. Otherwise, we will become a second class county. That's my opinion on, on that. But I think that we need to separate out some of this, Gary, and talk a little more about how what you're proposing instead of tying everything to the grooming. And I appreciate Commissioner Hogue advocating for his area. He should do that. Any commissioner that sits from that district over there should be advocating for these kinds of opportunities. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. But I think that we need to make sure that the piece of equipment that the side-by-side -side is something that your department actually needs. The grooming and all that stuff is a whole different discussion in my world. And I would like to see us talk further about the side-by-side -side and how do we deal with this year with the situation at uh, Wolf Lake. So at this point, my, my suggestion is, is that we, I would be in favor of you purchasing the side-by-side, -side, but I want to hear a little more about some of the advantages and what that's going to bring to the table for your staff. And if you have that information now, I would be glad to listen to that. Well, the sure, I, I, I do have it. Um, currently, you know, It'll be great to have some folks have you guys uh, go to a couple timber sales someday and to get back to some of these uh, remote areas of our county. Um, make sure your coffee cup is, is less than half full, right? Because you're going to get jostled around. But uh, before a forester or a logger goes in there and actually probably plows a road and to get back into where the sale is at, 
a lot of times our foresters got to put the logger on the back of a four-wheeler or their feet dangling over and or jump on a snowmobile um, and um, the trying to show them the, the, the lot and, and sell the timber, you know, could be greatly enhanced with actual two seats, um, a heated cab, uh, the conditions for staff could be greatly improved and for our customer, which is potential logger. Uh, and that's just one benefit. Out at the landfill, um, I've always thought that, um, you know, driving a one-ton pickup or a three-quarter ton pickup that's getting five, six miles a gallon back and forth, back and forth, 50 times a day from the office to the HHW building to the recycling to the mattress, um, I think is, to me, wasteful. We never ha have had a different, we've never done it different, and to me, having a more economical and kind of a little bit of a flexible vehicle to do that because of how it physically is, has been built out there uh, would be beneficial at the landfill as well. So both of those are huge, nothing to do with grooming. I was, I agree with you, trying to uh, capitalize on the opportunity we have in front of us. Um, to continue a grooming, if you will, um, um, program that we've done for 30, 40 years and do it um, in and amongst all this other stuff that we see coming um, uh, uh, in front of us at the landfill is, I think, seizing an opportunity. However, I get that for some that decision has been made, uh, for some they wanted it more discussed. I'm just looking at trying to capitalize on that opportunity and do it at a lower cost for our customer. That's what the whole goal was. Um, and uh, yes, uh, if I could, for, to Doug's point, we're always looking to try to enhance recreational opportunity in our county any way we probably can. But we, we definitely can do it with 5,000 a year. To me, I thought it was better use of that 5,000 and a little more of investment to keep our parks cleaner, keep our trails more maintained, our landfill better monitored, and do the grooming at the same time for a lower cost. That's all I was trying to do. But yes, from back to your original question, uh, Chair, um, huge benefit to have um, that type of tool for our, our um, employees, whether we're doing grooming or not. Let's see. If, if you needed more, I'm sure we have, I, I apologize, you know, Ryan is really, his, 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 we've talked about this at length, I didn't bring a lot of my notes, but he has a laundry list of different reasons and how that could be beneficial to his team. I don't know how the other commissioners feel about just the side-by-side, -side, but I see that as an asset for the department. The other grooming portion of it, I think, bears additional discussion on how we deal with this year with the ski club and that. and. So how, how, if I could, I'm always looking for that clear direction. How do you want to proceed with getting to that decision? Do you want it on a county board meeting so you guys can just, for once and for all, go, this is how you're going to vote to either give them the money, have us do the grooming, or, you know, at some point I, I think that ski club is looking for a decision, and by all means, we're just kind of going, what do you want us to do? And currently right now we have... We haven't prepared for grooming, by all means. We are out, we sold the equipment and we were done. So um, we can, if we don't bring this back, obviously we're not gonna do grooming, Is that's where we're at today. Just so you guys know where we're at, in case there was any confusion. So I would like that brought to the board and we will make a decision. Yep. And the side-by-side -side should be a separate request. Do you want to request the 5,000, 5,500? That's what you'll be dealing with in terms of grooming, mm -hmm. not the side-by-side. -side. Correct. Okay. But do you want that as a proposal? You just want more of a discussion point. Sometimes I, I don't get, uh, I get a little crossways because maybe yeah, I go ski trail grooming discussion and then it's a little wide open, right? Do we want to, is it just either you're going to give the club the money or, and, or not? Maybe it's just at that. Right. Is that what Commissioner Coring is? Well, that's what I think he's asking. I mean, it looks from sitting back here in the cheap seats, it, it looks like he's just asking for us to make a decision. Yes, I'd like to vote on it. Vote no. So 
put it on the county board meeting at the next meeting and it's either yay or nay to give them 5,500. Right. That's Doesn't that I'm make saying. sense? The, the yep. cost of that side by side is one number. That yep, that is we deal different. With. The 5,500 is a separate number. I still don't understand, Mr. Chair, what's up with the side by side. I mean, that, that's nothing to do with the grooming, is it? Or? No. No. Absolutely not. It, it, it has to do with an asset for land right. services in terms of timber sales and I'm just I'm just kind of worried that we're getting the side by side and then saying we've got a side by side we might as well start grooming but that's not your reasoning correct correct that's Good. correct perfect any other discussion on this are we all clear on where we're going with this one I, th I think we've been cautioned by Gary already, though, that if we give this money to one group, we better plan on giving it to all the groups. <laughs> and it does, I, it isn't taxpayer levy money. It does come from the timber sales. So. So my argument there, Commissioner Franzine, would be that we've done this for many, many years, and any of these groups could have come at any one of those years and made that same argument that we're talking about might be proposed by us giving the $5,500. In theory, we've already given $5,500 or $4,500, whatever the number would be in the past because our staff have been out there doing this. We've had the piece of equipment. So that argument is, is already on the table, in my view. Well, I guess there's probably a lot of things that the commissioners don't know that people are doing, but I know that I had no idea we were out grooming those trails. I don't believe that Commissioner Coring knew we were out grooming those trails. You know, so it was, it was quite a surprise. So when, of right. course, when it came to the budget meeting, since I had no idea that it was ever being done, I'm gonna vote against it. <laughs> and if I can, sure. uh, I know I, I don't wanna beat it. That's what I think is great about how we do our budgeting now is um, we budget s pretty conservative in our, our TF account. Uh, prior to, I wanna say, uh, me as being a director, th that side by side, any new stuff would have been loaded into a budget that you would approve that the 60, 80, 90 million that we're up to now, the big budget, and you don't get that more of a little more deep dive on some of those um, very significant pieces, but they just get loaded into those big giant budgets. And it's hard for sometimes to, to uh, um, understand what's going on. Now for, for me, it does get to be a little more under a microscope, but I like that. So you guys really get a yay or nay on a lot of these. So you see more budget amendments now from land services than you ever had because we don't budget for anything unless we get money. And then we go, oh, we do have some money. Do it, what, what are the needs, mm -hmm. you know? Other than, of course, we have keeping the lights on stuff that's budgeted. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. But, well, I think it did. Um, I know that our last budget meeting, I didn't think accomplished anything. I had asked for a line-by-line -line item. We didn't get it. You had to ask for it to possibly get it. So I, I just was very disappointed in the last meeting and we're you know, there was nothing to talk about. We didn't have the line by line. And we have had, not always, but previously we have had more of a line by line budget, which has gone away now. And um, that's what I want to go by. What are, we, what are we actually voting for? Because in January, I found out we voted for things that I didn't even know were on the budget last year. Mm. So I'm, I'm not happy with last year's budget. I never, ha never was after I found out, you know, a few things. So I like the line by line item. I want to, you know, I don't wanna make a decision about any of this stuff. Last year, yes, I wanted to make the decision because I hadn't known about it. So, so yes, I didn't wanna do it because I didn't know that it was happening. Um, it needs to be line by line. What are we doing and, and how much are we paying and, and you know, and then I'll make a, a new decision for this next year. You know, we're pretty clever, uh, Commissioner Franzine. I can give you two lines, uh, revenue and expense. I would still be line by line. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> All right, anything else today? Thank you, Gary, for right. doing Thank this. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gary. 
If there's nothing else, we are finished with today's business. You are adjourned. Gary. Gary.